on this Thursday night, pushing for answers. This is a yes or no answer. Which is it? Did the PMO press the former attorney general in a criminal investigation of an industry giant? I don't have any comment. And were you pressured by PMO, ma'am? Jody Wilson-Raybould won't say, but the PMO denies the allegations. At issue is here to talk about the potential damage to the Liberals. This is the shelf that we have available for flu vaccine, and as you can see, we don't have any. In a flu season that's hit kids hard, why some parents can't get the protection they need, and why the solution isn't as simple as it seems. I think it was important to record the songs in the language, in the tone, in the spirit in which they were written. And a trove of recently discovered lyrics tells the story of ordinary Jewish people in a dark time turning their history into art all the way to the Grammys. This is The National. The Prime Minister and his office are under fire tonight. A report in the Globe and Mail says the PMO pressed the former Justice Minister to intervene in a criminal case involving charges against Quebec-based giant SNC-Lavalin. The story dominated question period. It's quite clear that we are seeing the beginnings of a cover-up here. Did anyone in the Prime Minister's office at any time communicate with anyone in the former Attorney General's office on the matter of the criminal prosecution of FNC Lavalin? The Globe and Mail reported this morning that Trudeau's office pressed Jody Wilson-Raybould to step in to help Canada's largest engineering and construction company in its legal dealings with prosecutors. Justin Trudeau says the story is false. But as David Cochran tells us, Wilson-Raybould herself is staying, staying silent. It seems like an explicit denial. The allegations in the Globe story this morning are false. Uh, neither the current nor the previous Attorney General uh, was ever directed by me or by anyone in my office uh, to uh, take a, a decision uh, in this matter. Until you parse the words, which is exactly what the opposition did. It obviously sounded like the, uh, those words were written by a lawyer, not, uh, not the Prime Minister's own words. He, was, he refused to answer questions about whether or not there was any interference. He kept coming back to a very carefully, legally vetted response. The focus is on Trudeau's use of the word directed, which is not what the Globe and Mail reported. The newspaper says Trudeau's office pressed his former justice minister to intervene in the SNC-Lavalin case, and she refused. The construction giant is facing criminal charges for allegedly bribing Libyan officials to get contracts. A conviction would mean a ban from doing government work for 10 years. The pressure, according to The Globe, was to allow SNC-Lavalin to pay fines and restitutions instead of facing those criminal charges. Are you saying categorically there was absolutely no influence or any pushing whatsoever in this? The allegations reported in the story are false. Uh, at no time did I or uh, my office uh, direct uh, the current or previous Attorney General. Minister of Veteran Affairs. Jody Wilson-Raybould was moved from Justice to Veterans Affairs in last month's cabinet shuffle. The opposition sees a link. When the now former Justice Minister refused to drop the fraud and corruption trial against SNC-Lavalin, she was fired. Again, did anyone in the Prime Minister's office communicate with the former Justice Minister about this case? Yes or no? Neither the Prime Minister nor his office put the, my predecessor or myself under pressure, nor gave any directives. These allegations contained in the Globe and Mail, Mr. Speaker, are false. The new Justice Minister did a lot of talking today. The former minister who could settle this did none. Sir, what's your reaction to the Globe and Mail story today, please? I don't have any comment. And were you pressured by PMO, ma'am? Anyone in PMO? Okay, David, so Jody Wilson-Raybould could probably bring some clarity to all of this, but she is not doing that right now. No, she's not at all. She's refusing to talk on camera, as you just saw. So I followed up with her office, and in particular, I asked them, does she endorse the prime minister's statement that there was no direction or no pressure of any kind? And again, I got another no comment. So here you have a cabinet minister refusing to back the prime minister in public, which is a real problem for this story because it gives it a lot of fuel. Now, as for the prime minister's office, they are adamant there was no direction, there was no pressure of any kind, and they're rejecting the suggestion that Jody Wilson-Raybould was shuffled out of the ministry 
Ministry of Justice because of this. They insist that if Scott Bryson had not told them he was resigning and retiring from politics, there would have been no shuffle, and Jody Wilson-Raybould would be the Minister of Justice right now. Okay. David Cochran in Ottawa tonight. Thanks yep. for your work on this. So allegations, as the prime minister's office says, but there was a possible alternative to criminal charges in the SNC-Lavalin case, and it's something called a Deferred Prosecution Agreement, or a DPA. It's a new process in Canada just since last fall, but what is it, and how does it fit into this story? A DPA is kind of like a plea bargain for economic crimes like fraud or bribery. Criminal charges are dropped if the accused admits to wrongdoing. Usually it pays a big fine, gives back any benefit it received, and promises to make corporate changes. They are pretty commonly used in the U.S. and the U.K. In this case, the RCMP laid fraud and corruption charges against SNC-Lavalin in 2015. But today, SNC says those responsible no longer work for the company, and it's beefed up its ethics and compliance rules. That's why it's been pushing for a DPA. Federal prosecutors said no. And that's when, the Globe and Mail reports, the PMO allegedly pressed the then-Justice Minister to pressure prosecutors to reconsider. So still lots of questions with this story, Ian. What are the political repercussions of the allegations? It is Thursday, fortunately. That means it's at issue night, so they will be here a little bit later. But you are following a growing political crisis in the United States tonight. And Rosie, that crisis in Virginia, while well, there is new information all the time on it, two of its top politicians, both Democrats, admitting to appearing in blackface in their past, and now it's a Republican facing scrutiny. Anything to say about the yearbook, sir? Local media discovered Virginia's Senate Majority Leader Tommy Norman was the managing editor of a college yearbook in 1968, which included images of blackface. This after Virginia's governor faced questions about his yearbook page from 1984 and is now under pressure to resign. And the state's attorney general, also a Democrat, revealed he too had appeared in blackface years ago. Blackface has long been used by white people across North America to depict black people as backward, lazy, or worse. And today, a top Democrat in Washington denounced the images. The history of blackface in this country is um, the history of racism in this country, the history of slavery in this country. And so how are people in Virginia reacting? Paul Hunter went to find out. Run! At Richmond, Virginia's Union University, a school where more than 90% of the students are black, a church service today to help everyone try to make sense of something so ugly and hurtful that it demands a fierce response. We're not reacting to an act, we're reacting to what the act represents. Among the speakers, civil rights activist Al Sharpton on the ugliness in question. Blackface represents a deeper problem where people felt they could dehumanize and humiliate people based on their inferiority. That their own state governor wore blackface as a student, he said, is not only racist, it's a betrayal. After all, the governor ran on a platform of inclusivity, elected by all to be fair to all. Because if you can mock us, then you can legislate and govern against us and nobody will care. Indeed, outside the church, the view is it's all evidence white politicians play black Americans for votes. Too often, individuals that come to campaign, it's a song and dance. They campaign everywhere else. On the last Sunday before election uh, day, they go to the biggest black church they can find. Uh, they get rallied behind the NAACP, and that's how they have been trapping us. Almost exactly 400 years since the first slave ships arrived in America, landing in Virginia, it's clear the state still grapples with that old problem of race. And it's hardly just black Americans who struggle with what to make of their governor and others caught up in this. How do you feel about what's going on at your state capitol? I'm embarrassed, um, and as a Virginian, I am ashamed. I'm, I'm ashamed to be a Virginian. Back at that church service, speaker after speaker reminded everyone they cannot be silent on this. And the only way that the enemy can be said is that we expose this. And once it's exposed, once we acknowledge, then we can dispose of it. 
Good, man. how are you? Said Sharpton, the bottom line is the governor must go. 400 years ago, it was slave traders. Don't get down in the capital 400 years later and become blackface traders. So, Paul, beyond the people we saw in your story, you spoke to, to a lot of residents and anger we heard. What about surprise? Yeah, well, I mean, certainly people were surprised that the governor has acknowledged being in blackface. I mean, as I say in the piece, um, he effectively campaigned on inclusivity. It was part of his political brand. It was a big reason uh, so many people, black and white, voted him into office. So are people surprised the governor has done that? Uh, yeah. Um, but are black people surprised that the attitudes behind that persist in this country 400 years later? No. I mean, there's evidence of it in you know, yearbook after yearbook that's emerging, uh, in every underfunded school in a black neighborhood, every underfunded housing project in a black neighborhood, every, every interaction with police, it seems. I mean, Charlottesville is just up the highway from here, right? So is, is it a surprise to black people that that attitude persists? No. Um, is it hurtful still? Yes. Surprising? No. Paul Hunter reporting from Virginia tonight. Thanks. Have you had the flu this season? If not, chances are you sure know someone who has. It has been a rough year, especially for kids. More than 120 have been treated in intensive care and 10 have died. And that's had parents rushing to get the flu shot for their kids. As Christine Birak tells us, that's left vaccines in short supply in some provinces. So this is the shelf that we have available for flu vaccine, and as you can see, we don't have any. It's not an easy conversation to have with parents, but... I unfortunately wasn't able to give you the flu vaccine. Pediatrician Jacob Rosenberg is having it. People are getting the vaccine. Unfortunately, uh, we ran out. <laughs> leaving six-month-old Jessica here and other young children in Ontario vulnerable to a flu strain that's hitting them particularly hard. To not be able to give a baby at six months old the highest risk group just seems absurd. <laughs> and it's not too late. Flu season happens in waves. As the first strain begins to wind down, Dr. Rosenberg says another is coming. Now, influenza B can be particularly dangerous for children and to not have the, an opportunity to be covered against it is, is a shame. Ontario Public Health says there is flu vaccine in the system. Problem is, it's largely in pharmacies and they aren't authorized to vaccinate children under the age of five. While other provinces are also beginning to run low, Nova Scotia is actually rationing flu shots. I was surprised because we never thought that we will run out. The province's chief medical officer of health is asking that pharmacists collaborate with local physicians to ensure children have access to vaccine. But moving the vaccine around is harder than you might think. It must be kept cold, but never frozen. Having flu shots change hands can threaten their effectiveness. It looks obvious that rules should be broken, but those rules are actually there for very good reason to protect the safety of, of our vaccine supply. After being turned away by walk-in clinics, Danielle Plack says a family doctor finally gave Jessica a dose of flu vaccine. But young children need two. It is frustrating. And there's no guarantee she'll get the second dose for protection. Christine Birak, CBC News, Woodbridge, Ontario. One last sobering statistic in all this, 13% of all reported flu deaths this season have been children. Another elite sports club is under scrutiny over allegations of assault in the locker room. This time it's a minor hockey program in North Vancouver. The allegations and how the club handled them have now led to the head coach quitting and an RCMP investigation. The CBC's Briar Stewart has the story. The North Shore Winter Club is a private, pricey facility renowned for its hockey program. Hall of Famers like Brett Hall, Joe Sackick and Paul Correa played here. Brad Rahella coached a youth hockey team at the club. I think that a lot of people understand the decision that I made and, and respect it. In January, he quit because he thought two players accused of bullying should have been kicked off the team instead of suspended. you got to give your players a, a positive working environment and um, ultimately, your job's to protect your players. So, uh, you know, I made this decision to step away. Um, you know, 
He didn't want to talk about specifics, but the incident dates back to December. A lawyer for the alleged victim describes it as an assault, adding the discipline as applied by the club was insufficient and does not appropriately deal with the gravity of what occurred. The North Shore Winter Club says it immediately suspended the players. When an internal investigation found that there were two incidents of bullying, players were disciplined, and that included further suspensions from team play, writing apology letters, and undergoing a professional anti-bullying session. CBC News spoke to a few parents whose sons play on the hockey team, and their reactions to the investigation varied. One told us he thought the whole matter had been blown out of proportion, while another said that the coach is so highly respected that the incident must have been serious for him to resign. All of these measures are in place to protect the athlete. The sports consultant says Hockey Canada policy requires that two adults be in the dressing room with minor players, but he admits that it can be difficult to adhere to. He says coaches need to teach their players what is and is not acceptable. Anti-bullying is not something that's new, um, but the layers of bullying and the, well, I just said this or I was just joking or, or whatever the case may be, um, that's really what has to be decided by the adult parties. For now, the police investigation continues and nearly everyone involved with the team is hesitant to speak publicly. Briar Stewart, CBC News, North Vancouver. Here are some other stories we're following tonight on The National. So many people in British Columbia are being killed by drugs contaminated by fentanyl. The province's senior medical official says the government should be ensuring there is a safe, regulated supply of drugs. This after the coroner's office announced almost 1,500 people died of illicit drug overdoses or poisonings in 2018. To give you some perspective on that, that is significantly more deaths than suicides, motor vehicle related deaths and homicides combined in this province. The majority of people dying are middle aged men and 86% of the victims died indoors in residences. The coroner says there were no deaths at supervised consumption sites or at overdose prevention sites. <laughs> The first trucks carrying food and medicine have arrived at the Venezuelan border. But despite the celebrations, this is still standing in the way. Yesterday, the government blocked the border crossing with shipping containers and a fuel tanker. The embattled president, Nicolas Maduro, denies the existence of a humanitarian crisis in Venezuela. The trucks will be parked at a warehouse on the Colombia side until the aid can be delivered. Ahead tonight on The National, we'll go in-depth on the big story out of Ottawa here tonight. Did the Prime Minister's office press the former Justice Minister to interfere, interfere in a case? At issue is here to tackle the denial and the damage control. And a little later, how a chance discovery by a Canadian professor has turned into a Grammy-nominated album. Cool. First, though, a marketplace investigation. Charles E. Agroga shows us how easy it is for hackers to get your information by getting hacked herself. Hello, I'm I'm good. My name is Charlesy. And while I'm at it, could I add uh, my, my personal assistant as a level one user? Everyone's always going to get hacked. It's just a matter of when that happens, not if that happens. And it's how do you respond to that? This week's Marketplace investigation has found an old-fashioned con is targeting Canadians in new ways. Hackers are using their powers of persuasion to gain access to telecom accounts. All they need is a few pieces of your personal information. Charles Liagro shows us the hack in action. Hello, I'm good. My name is Charlesy. Actually, his name is Joshua Krumba. He is an ethical hacker impersonating me to illustrate how the latest type of phone hack works. Uh, Charlie, can I get you postal code, please, and date of birth? Uh, date of birth is February. A few personal details later, and this customer service rep is buying it. Krumba is in my cable account, and I'm locked out. All right, and, and while I'm at it, could I add uh, my, my personal assistant as a level one user? Absolutely, yes. 
The technique he used is called social engineering. A hacker charms a customer service agent using a few publicly available pieces of my personal information, eventually convincing them to hand over the rest. It's just psychology. So if you understand how somebody's going to react to something, you can easily uh, manipulate somebody into giving you information or access to things that maybe they shouldn't. While I got locked out of my accounts, others have suffered far worse at the hands of hackers. $30,000 equivalent in crypto. Former cryptocurrency executive Aaron Tomlinson lost thousands after hackers used a series of eight online chats to convince customer service reps to hand over enough information to take over her account. As far as she can tell, the hackers only had her name and telephone number when they started. They were given my account number my email, my credit card information, my birth date, um, the amount of data on my account, my last bill amount. Tomlinson's losses may sound extreme, but companies around the world say social engineering attacks are on the rise. Since Canada's privacy commissioner started requiring companies to report privacy breaches in November, there have been more than a dozen reported cases involving social engineering in this country's telecommunications sector alone. From your perspective, what could companies be doing to better protect consumers? I, I think the biggest thing is education. We have got to do more in making our people aware that these things happen. Well, I mean, it's, it's obviously alarming. Um, Every, every Canadian for sure is at risk right now. And so, Charles, uh, what did Rogers say to you? Well, Ian, they do tell us they take their customers' privacy and security very seriously. They also say they provide ongoing training for their staff. And when it comes to my hack, they say their verification processes were not followed properly by that customer service rep. Now, Erin, obviously not happy with how things worked out in her case. She's suing, but, but beyond that, what should companies and consumers be doing differently? Ian, experts that we talk to say companies need to do a better job educating and training their staff. They also say, though, that those security questions that rely on personal pieces of information just don't go far enough. It's too easy for a hacker to find out your postal code or your email address. They say those questions need to change. In the meantime, though, they do suggest consumers consider adding a PIN to your account. I know it didn't work in my case, but try not to connect it to a person personal detail like a birth date or an address. They also suggest you consider adding a personal security question to your account, something that only you know, or consider making up a fake answer to some of those questions, even harder for a hacker to guess. And then lastly, Ian, the number one thing consumers can do, vote with your wallet. If you're not happy with the privacy and security measures offered by your provider, consider switching. Thanks, Charlesy. You're welcome. And you can watch the full Marketplace investigation tomorrow night on CBC Television. It starts at 8 p.m., 8.30 in Newfoundland. Up next on The National, the Prime Minister denies the allegations, but the opposition still wants answers. Was the former Justice Minister under any kind of pressure to help SNC-Lavalin? Andrew, Chantal and Althea are all here for At Issue, and that's right after the break. And a little later in tonight's moment, Tom Power, the host of CBC Radio's Q, gets an impromptu show from two of music's biggest names. They just walk in and David says, and all of you can come too, right? So all the Sting's publicists, our producers, uh, David Foster's publicists, a pretty big team, all just crowd in here. with an extraordinary allegation. He says he was the target of extortion and blackmail by a tabloid newspaper. And he's posted what he says are email exchanges with American Media Incorporated, which publishes the National Enquirer. Those emails allege the Enquirer has revealing personal photos of him. Bezos, who owns the Washington Post, had already ordered an investigation into the tabloid to find out how it got access to those other photos and private messages. Bezos said he was told the photos of him would not be published only if the Post stopped its investigations. I am going to deliver Brexit. I'm going to deliver it on time. That's what I'm going to do for the British public. I'll be negotiating hard in the coming days to do just that. Despite her best intentions, the UK Prime Minister, Theresa May, made no breakthroughs on Brexit talks today in Brussels. 
She's asking EU leaders for changes to the deal, mainly around the issue of the Irish backstop. But the president of the European Commission says he will not reopen the agreement. It's not all over just yet, though. The two sides are set to meet again at the end of the month. The allegations in the Globe story this morning are false. Did anyone in the Prime Minister's office at any time communicate with anyone in the former Attorney General's office? As the Prime Minister has said earlier today, these allegations are false. This is a yes or no answer. As the Prime Minister outlined today, he has not given directives to either my predecessor and or myself. When the now former Justice Minister refused to drop the fraud and corruption trial against SNC-Lavalin, she was fired. I don't have any comment. Just some of the heated exchanges and responses and reactions from uh, today on Parliament Hill and with the Prime Minister. This after the Globe and Mail reported that the Prime Minister's office allegedly pressed the former Justice Minister and Attorney General to strike a deal with SNC-Lavalin and avoid prosecuting the engineering firm. The Prime Minister says the allegations are false, but there's still lots of questions. Let's bring in at issue for some analysis. Chantal Hébert is in Montreal, Andrew Coyne is in Toronto, and Althea Raj is here in Ottawa tonight. Um, I'll start with you, Chantal. What do you make of the government's response to these allegations? Definitively saying the allegations are false, but the language after that a little more precise. Um, it doesn't really matter how precise or unprecise the language was, in as much as the government could have uh, ended uh, much of this controversy today had one of its own ministers stood up to say, no, I wasn't pressured, uh, and there's nothing to this story, and that would be Jody Wilson-Raybould. That is not what happened. And so you are treated to the site of uh, the prime minister and the minister at the center of the story, clearly not on the same page. And, and what should we make of that, Andrew, the fact that uh, Jody Wilson-Raybould did not say anything more than no comment? I, I, I mean, I, I don't want to ascribe too much motivation, but obviously that's not good to just leave that hanging out there like that either. Well, and, and ha having issued that strange letter after she was demoted right. in the cabinet shuffle in which she said, amongst other things, that she'd stood against you know, the, the uh, political interference in the office of the, of the attorney general. Uh, that seems like a thing you wouldn't necessarily need to say if there was nothing like that happening. So uh, it's going to be quite a cabinet meeting, the next, uh, next cabinet meeting. I don't know how much more serious it can get, you know, if you've got a, what's alleged here is that a large, well-connected corporation facing serious charges of uh, fraud and corruption uh, could basically have those you know, charges put aside or, or trans transferred into this uh, deferred prosecution method mm -hmm. uh, by a call to the Prime Minister's office. Um, what kind of country is that that allows that? Althea, how did, what did you make of the response from the government today? Well, they didn't say that there had been no communications or no conversations. They just said that she had not been pressured and had not been directed. Um, and so I think that that's very important to stress. Um, I completely 100% <laughs> agree with Chantal about the fact that Jody Wilson-Raybould could have put this issue to rest had she chosen to do so. But actually, a lot of people, I would say, in the prime minister's office and especially in caucus believe that Jody Wilson-Raybould is the source of that story. And that does make, to Andrew's point, um, you know, raise some important questions about what happens in cabinet going forward. How can you have a cabinet uh, discussion that is frank, open, um, if you think that one member of that team uh, might uh, leak things that they are uncomfortable with to members of the media. So there's like two parts to this story. You know, the one is the personal dynamics that are happening within the Trudeau cabinet. Um, and then there's the whole issue about is there, you know, fire where there is smoke? Because it does look like uh, there may have been some impropriety, but when you look actually at what Jody Wilson Raybould's role is, she is. Uh, in the law allowed to intervene as long as that is transparent and public. Let's be clear, it's not only Jody Wilson-Raybaud's non-denials, it's the Prime Minister's non-denial of a denial. The, the charge that he denied was a charge that wasn't made, which is that there was an explicit direction as opposed to influence or pressure. So it was a very lawyerly, as others, as the, others have said, a very lawyerly statement. When he was asked explicitly by the reporters there, he retreated back into the same statement uh, I think if he wanted to serve his cause, he might have better have not had that press conference at all than do what he did. Uh, Rosie, yeah. uh, if you don't mind, I'd just like to rewind the tape a bit. Uh, yes. 
because yes, what all that happened today kind of showed that uh, there are holes in the government story and there are, there are gaping holes in it. But if you rewind and you look at the entire picture, what you see is the insertion of this legal mechanism to replace prosecution it goes back to 2017. So this looks like something, if it, there is something, that started way before there was a clash and a conversation, or call it what you want, uh, with Jody Wilson-Raybould. That's one. Two, yes, uh, Lavalin is well connected, but any government under any prime minister would pause at the notion that uh, one of the world's leading engineering firms and our leading engineering firms with thousands of people working for it in Canada could go under. So uh, set that and the motivations that the government could have had if it went down that road. And finally, I have to say that if you are a person of such principle that you feel that you, someone is trying to interfere with the justice system, in the old days, that person would have stood up and resigned, not leaked to a newspaper or walked around saying no comment. So, I mean, obviously, we, we, don't, we don't know the source, I, but I, I take your point, Althea, that people are suggesting this. Is there a reason why Jody Wilson-Raybould uh, would not talk here? Like, a, a logical reason. Uh, certainly, we know she was angry. We know she was upset about the cabinet shuffle. That's the, I don't think that's something we can dispute. But, Andrew, is there another reason why she might not be comfortable saying more? Well, I, is that plausible? I, I don't know. If the story is true, <laughs> we're speculating, of course. But uh, if she, you know, yeah, if the story is true, if she's still in cabinet, uh, I mean, we don't know. I mean, whenever these stories come out, it's always as interesting not just the substance of the story, but who and why the mm -hmm. story was made public. Sure. Uh, one has to assume this was somebody familiar with the story, therefore somewhere close to the to the mm -hmm. former uh, justice minister. But we we just don't really know for sure. Yeah, I guess I was. I guess I was suggesting that maybe in her role as attorney general she thought she was the government's lawyer and protecting a client like I don't know whether any of that is is something that would have run through her head well that's that what she, she said yeah. publicly yeah. was I cannot comment because I was yeah uh, the, the government the government's government's lawyer but um, that may but not be you, you don't you don't look like you buy that go ahead Chantal uh, no but when you're faced with a story that you know is false right. you don't say no comment you say this is hogwash it's not true uh, I don't know who's been spinning that tale, but that is not my recollection. If, okay. if you see something that is false, that's what any normal person would do, including someone who is attorney general. We're not going into uh, a, a case that is in front of the courts here. This is not judicial discretion. Yes, yes. It's saying this is true or this is, this is not true. Okay. If you're not going to say it's false, yeah. then you should speak up and explain why you're saying no comment. I, I think Althea is right that the story has those two legs. There's the actual allegations, which are, are serious and we, we need to know more about, and then there's what this does to cabinet and government. So let's sort of pull back and talk about what the damage is to the government here. Well, I mean, it harkens back to the sponsorship scandal, right? We don't yet know if the story is true, uh, what was the benefit in the government acting in this way, right? And that's a big piece of that puzzle, if the story is indeed true. But usually when there is um, a type of story like this, it kind of comes out in little driblets. What is clear is that SNC-Lavalin lobbied hard uh, the Liberal government at all levels, whether it was cabinet ministers directly, the staff in their offices, the prime minister's office. And in fact, after it was made public that the pu public prosecutor was not going to offer them uh, this sort of... Uh -huh version of a plea bargain, uh, they actually met with Ambassador McNaughton. They met again with the Prime Minister's office, and then they came out and said they were going to appeal the decision. So from the record that is public, and in yes. if there is a meeting that the PMO asks for, for example, SNC-Lavalin doesn't need to register that. So the, the snapshot that we have makes it very clear that they were extremely dedicated to this issue and putting immense pressure on the government. It would be wrong of the uh, Attorney General herself to interfere with the Director of Public Prosecutions without posting it publicly. There are provisions right. in which she can make, issue instructions, but it has to be public. So you have yeah. that combination of accountability and yet independence from political interference. Mm -hmm. It is especially wrong, or would be especially wrong, if there were political staff in the Prime Minister's office pressuring her to do so on behalf of, let's not forget, a company that just recently essentially evaded charges. They, they did a compliance agreement on, on charges of funneling over $100,000 in illegal campaign contributions to the Liberal Party of Canada. So if there was anybody they were ever going to uh, inter intervene with or make any suggestions, any representations of any kind, the last one should be SNC-Lavalin. 
So that just th makes it absolutely radioactive in this case. Mm. And whether, you know, SNC Lavalin likes to, would like to pursue a strategy of saying, oh, there'll be all these jobs lost if we actually have to face criminal prosecution, I'm not sure that really should sit well with people, sort of basically taking those workers hostage to avoid accountability and responsibility for what they are accused of having done. Mind you, uh, the notion that you are banned for a decade from pursuing federal contracts yes. and what that does to you internationally is not just a slap on the wrist and it does impact on those workers. Sure. Uh, I, and I hate to use those words, but I'm convinced that part of the argument, if someone went down the road of arguing for giving uh, SNC Lavalin a pass from criminal prosecution in exchange for uh, giving money back, etc., would be too big to fail. An argument that we heard at the time of the global financial crisis. This yeah. is not a small uh, company th whose demise would not be felt, uh, not only on the jobs front, but uh, on the innovation front. So yeah. I'm guessing that was what they lobbied on. It couldn't have been on their contributions to the liberal coffers anymore because those have become In 2011. illegal. Yes. Okay. Got to leave it there. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate it. Before we go, though, be sure to subscribe to Ad Issue, the podcast, for extra content. This week, we're also talking about the growing tensions in Alberta, given I just come back from there, around the future of the energy industry. Look for it on iTunes, any major podcast app, our website, cbcnews.ca slash the national. And up next on The National, the Grammy-nominated album bringing history to life. How a Canadian professor helped unearth the stories of ordinary Jewish people during the Second World War. The one thing that we didn't expect to see in this collection that so much of it is humorous. It showed that Jews were laughing in the circumstances where we can't imagine people laugh. Canadians will be well represented at the Grammys this weekend. Drake has seven nominations, including a nod for Album of the Year. Jazz musician Diana Krall has a couple, so does pop star Shawn Mendes. But of all the Canadians who could bring home a Grammy, a Jewish studies professor, probably not the best known. Anna Sternschuss is the force behind a record that brought history to life. Yiddish Glory captures lost songs created during the darkest days for Jewish people in the Soviet Union. And now it could win the Grammy for Best World Music Album. Here's how the project came together. The rumors that the songs were collected existed, but scholars believed that this collection was destroyed and never survived the war. Turns out it did survive the war. Today, we realize that these songs are the first eyewitness uh, testimonies by Jews of what was happening on the eve of the Holocaust. They're not beautiful songs crafted by the best songwriters of that era. They're songs written by ordinary people living their lives, experiencing the war, experiencing Hitler and Stalin and all of that, and uh, somehow maintaining, continuing to live a life and writing in their own voices. So he sang 10 or 11 songs on this project. He is a fantastic musician who got uh, the sound exactly like it should be, not sentimental, you know what I mean? Like it was exactly the sound of Soviet Jews living through what they lived through. Anna had a very clear understanding of what she wanted to do. She didn't want to hire necessarily North American klezmer musicians. She wanted them to have a connection to the Soviet Union. Alexander Sebastian, genius accordionist. Every single one of the musicians had something personal about this. I think it was important to record the songs in the language, in the tone, in the spirit in which they were written. 
Es hat a Sturm wind mir gebracht in Asien ein. Und ich weiß schon gut, dass ich es ist Deutschland, Kasachstan, Kasachstan. One of the things about this uh, project is that the majority of the songs were written, were created by women. So it was really important to think of a female singer. And then I remembered many years ago, I had this wonderful student in my class named Sophie Millman. Oi find me, oi find me, cheruf, to ben and to It didn't take a lot of convincing because the material was so compelling and told told the story of my grandparents and what they went through in the war. When Sophie came aboard, this project got a completely new meaning, a new life. That's the Rubaro verse. Mm. And this song, Kazakhstan, talks about the whole Europe is after Jews. We're refugees everywhere. We're not welcome anywhere. And now we ended up in this weird place, which doesn't make any sense. Berg mit dem Knechen und mit Spitzen zu gedeckt mit weißen Schnee. It talks about the nature and the roughness of it and the extreme aspects of it, but it really it's talking about the internal struggle. Euch von mir zu seiter euch hat mir. It's the most obvious connection that I have to the project. I, you know, it immediately clicked for me what it must have been like for her in her early teens. And it was very cool to be able to do it in, a, in music, singing in the voices of people living at the time, not people now looking back, but literally living it in the moment, telling those stories in a simple, um, simple, very basic way. Some of the most violent songs in the collection were written by women. So these women, they're sitting somewhere in Central Asia and they imagine, they fantasize about these guys who go and kill as many enemy soldiers as they could and they motivate them to do that. He bashed those fascists without a care, not a bit of respect. The mutilated bodies fell near the half dead, covering the earth. One thing that we didn't expect to see in this collection that so much of it is humorous. And Purim Gifts for Hitler is one of those songs. It showed that Jews were laughing in the circumstances where we can't imagine people laugh. It's very life-affirming and humorous. And it shows us that this is how human beings make sense through things that should never happen to them, you know, through humor. <laughs> Up next on The National, you'll see another musical performance. This one, though, is off the cuff. Sting, David Foster, Studio Q, the moment after the break. Tom Power and the team at CBC Radio's Q got a surprise earlier this week, a spontaneous performance they had no hand in producing. Tom had just finished an interview with the one and only Sting, and he was just about to do another with David Foster, and one thing led to another, and the two were doing an impromptu performance of My Funny Valentine right on set. So we asked Tom about what it was like, and that is our moment tonight. At the end of the interview, he looks over and he says, who is that in the, in the, in the booth? 
and I thought he was talking about some of my producers, so I started saying the names, and I said, oh yeah, and of course David Foster's there too. So we, we go into the control room, and there's a moment where they hug, and David says, you know, Sting, I've always, I've always wanted to work with you, and Sting says, well, you know, I mean, one of these days it might happen, and they start talking, and then I don't really know how it happened, but uh, David Foster just says, well, how about we go in there and play my funny Valentine on piano right now? And In and David says, and all of you can come too, right? So all the Sting's publicists, our producers, uh, David Foster's publicists, a pretty big team, all just crowd in here. I mean, it felt amazing in the room. Uh, it was, you could hear a pin drop. Uh, they stand up, they hug one another, Sting's out the door, and then Foster sits back down and we do a 40 minute interview. Okay, I was just Googling uh, how old Sting is because he looks really good. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but also, Tom's got a cool job because, um, you know, that was, that was just impromptu uh, and off they went. And just to back up for a moment for people who may not know David, I mean, we know and people of our gen my generation know, uh, but uh, David Foster is kind of like Canada's Quincy Jones, a great musician, totally. a writer, a producer. He had a couple of hits as well, the music from St. Elmo's Far. Anyway, to have the two of them just, just sit down, you know, I envy Tom Power for lots of reasons, but this is just one more. What you could a nice... probably backfill. You could probably fill in for him. Yeah. I you have clout. Him tenth of the job that he does. But anyway, what a nice <laughs> moment on our moment. That is the National for February the 7th. Good night. Night.